our keynote speaker this evening is a graduate of FSU College of Medicine. He's a former Stride mentor, former MAPS member, and a member of the undergraduate Stride Outreach Program. His life story is one of triumph, resolve, and many successes. He has been and always will be an integral part of the Stride program and a role model to many. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jenny Moss. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, it's funny, whenever I see those uh, credentials up and I don't look at my diplomas and stuff, it's pretty cool to look back on it and it kind of calls you to flash back a little bit. Um, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a program that's very dear to my heart. This, um, the mission, the passion behind the efforts put into the program that you all are participating in today. You know, I've watched it develop and become what it is today from like its beginning roots. So to see that it's continuing to flourish, that it wasn't just a, a momentary trend that it grew into this massive program that produced a lot of healthcare prof professionals is very, very, it, it's very re refreshing and, and, and enjoy, enjoyable to see from the outside in. So a little bit about myself. I was born in South Florida to a single mom. I'm the oldest of three kids. And things as my during my childhood was typical. You know, I ran outside, played by the beach, did all the fun things. It wasn't until the age of 12 when I moved to New Jersey where things started to change for me. And the biggest change was my mother's health. Um, towards, you know, when I was you know, 10 or 11 years old, I started getting more and more ill. Um, we didn't have any resources. We leaned on, leaned on some family members in New Jersey. So we moved to New Jersey. And when we got there, I'll never forget the day. It was December 23rd, 1992. It was a rude awakening because all the highs, how you doing, come, come, we'll do whatever we can to work, help you out, so forth and so forth, so on. All those things kind of went away. And then within a matter of a few days, we went from being in my aunt's living room to living in a homeless shelter. And so at the age of 12, I had to wake up pretty, 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 um, I grew up pretty quickly because I realized that, well, no one's coming to help us out. No one's coming to, to make amends for all the past trials and tribulation of my family. I have to stand up for myself and be the man of the family. I got my first job at the age of 12. I worked on a tire factory. Um, at that point, I moved to working on a farm. Uh, we moved to a smaller city from a town to a smaller city in New Jersey and where we get some more assistance. But, you know, that kind of pushed me towards my first step in leadership and, and ownership of my own situations. Um, graduated from high school, did pretty well, went to a small college in New Jersey, couldn't afford it, dropped out, went back, um, transferred down to Florida State University because I got married. And around 2002, I was, you know, undergrad at Florida State University, doing my thing, taking my classes. And then one day, my wife at the time said that she met this guy named Mr. W Mr. Um, Wash Anderson, and he worked for the Urban League. And his wife, Mrs. Anderson, was helping individuals that wanted to do something in the medical field. Now, at this time, I was, you know, 22, 23. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a biology major because that's what everybody did. I was pretty good at science. I was going to be a chemist or teacher or something in that regards. And so I went to her office. I think it was in 2003, 2004. I finally got the nerve to go to her office. I'm never going to forget because the big, beautiful building y'all go to now that wasn't there. It was Florida High, and her office were in, was in some trailers. I remember going in, and it was half a chance because I didn't really have an appointment with her. I was supposed to meet with Rob Borgia. Is Rob still there? No, I was supposed to meet with Rob Borgia, thank God. <laughs> and she had a slot because someone canceled. Um, I went to her office, and when I got into her office, she had all these papers stacked up, and and I remember the whole time she was looking at my application and she was looking at my, my transcript and I was talking to her and I felt like I was wasting her time. I felt like I shouldn't have been there. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't know I wanted to be. I'm 23 years old. My marriage is falling apart. I'm a decent student in school. I was working full time, going to school part time. And then she asked me a question that basically changed the architecture of my entire existence. Um, in the midst of her looking at my transcript, she turned to me and said, have you ever thought about being a doctor? And the, the, the easy answer is no. Um, but it wasn't so much the question that woke me up. It was her planting a seed. 
it was her planning an idea inside of me that I never knew would turn into what it turned into. So I was 23, 24 years old when someone first challenged me, they challenged my spirit with the question of, what's your calling? What do you wanna be? Who are you going to be? What are you going to do? And it was that question that I took home with me that evening that I buried inside of my spirit that manifested into something that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about later. Um, I went on to get more involved in Stride. I became vice president of MAPS. I met some lifelong friends. Some of you may have heard them speak before Dr. Rashid, Rashad Sullivan, one of my closest friends. I met all these people that I felt like were part of my, my path, but I didn't really appreciate the gravity of what they were doing and what they were giving me at the moment. Uh, but through Stride and through all the programs and through all the assistance from Mrs. Anderson, what I call my mother actually, I was able to transition from an undergrad student who didn't know what they wanted to become to a medical school student in a period of about two and a half years. I went from not knowing what an MCAT was to sitting in an auditorium with Dean Little looking at me and she said, you're not here because of a, of a mistake. You're not here because someone just had an extra seat. You're here because you're called to become physicians. And I'm never gonna forget that conversation she had with the entire group of hundreds of uh, medical students in 2006, it felt like she was talking to me. And I've told her this before, and I don't know if she's on today, but I told her this before. I said, that conversation that you had with us, that this is a calling, I took it seriously. I, I took medical school and my path to becoming a physician very seriously. And so I went from there to have my struggles in medical school. We'll talk about it in a little bit. I was able to graduate fortunately with, from medical school with uh, honors. I transitioned from there to Mayo Clinic. I did internal medicine. I went from internal medicine to anesthesia, graduated from anesthesia with honors, and I went on to Harvard to become a critical care physician. And now I'm in St. Louis. So the story of homeless to Harvard only tells a fraction of my entire story, right? It just gives you a, a, a timeline of what you think my life could have been, what it should have turned into if I didn't meet the right people. But more importantly, it gives you a, a view of what it actually became. Um, I look back now and I, I'm still surprised. I still find myself smiling, a big house, nice cars, got a good job. And I never imagined this for myself. And the reason why it's important for me to tell you that is because I think as we get older, you know, my gray hairs, the one thing we lose outside of our sinews and our muscles and our backs, my back is bad now. One thing we lose is our imagination. And what Stride did for me, if I can tell you anything today, it actually opened my, or reopened my imagination. When I say this in some of my speeches, when we were kids, when someone asked you, could you run fast or could you jump far? A lot of you raised your hand. If someone asked you if you could sing or you could dance, you know, I could sing. It wasn't until you got to middle school, high school, even college, for those who were in college, where you started, to, you started to question yourself. You started to let your outside environment, outside influences dictate what you thought of yourself, what you thought you could become, what you thought you could be. And what Stride and Mrs. Anderson did for me and Dr. Littles that day is that they opened up my imagination. They reminded me that my life was not just this meaningless, you know, person just walking through and taking classes. No, I had a purpose. And it, you know, I'm not getting to religion and everything, but I believe that God put me in the path of these individuals in this program to help me realize my purpose. And all you can do right now at this stage in your life is imagine, right? You can imagine what being a doctor is. You can imagine what being a physician or a nurse practitioner is, but you don't really know. And I have the, the beauty today, as I was mentioning earlier to the young ladies, to talking to you all from a perspective of if I could go back to high school, if I could go back to my 19, 20 year old self and say, self, this is what the plan is. I wouldn't invest in the Apple, I probably should, but I would, what would I give myself? What would I say to myself to help me out? More importantly, you are looking at someone who is in a position where you are trying to get to. The problem is you don't know what's gonna happen in between. You have no idea what's gonna happen from high school to college to medical school. It's a vision, it's an idea, it's a part of your imagination, but you really don't have anything other than someone saying, here, here's a blueprint. 
Stride, Maps, Florida State, they offer you a blueprint, but you still have no idea what's going to happen. And I think if you get too caught up in the process of what you can become, you actually lose out on who you are becoming. If I can give you all four pieces of advice today, um, it would be as such. The first piece of advice is treat your life like a square. Um, it wasn't until later in life that someone told me this principle it was a Indian prof um, professor at one of my institutions I trained at, Dr. Patel. He said, what are the most important borders of your life? What are the most important sides of your square? And I had an idea what it was. And I think a lot of you have an idea what it is, but it wasn't until I sat down and actually drew out my square and I outlined the four pillars of what I think is important that it all started to make sense of why he was asking me. Because what he was trying to imply was that in order for your life to become big, in order for it, become, in order for it to become balanced, you have to equally grow the areas of your life that are important. One of the biggest fallacies of this field and this career um, is that once you are finished, everything is going to be okay. Um, once you start making money, everything is going to be okay. Once you get your titles, everything is going to be okay. And it's not true. The only thing that's going to happen once you become a physician is that the challenges are going to change. The focus you put on things that consist of your square are going to change. Um, I could tell you what's on my square. But it's not important. What's important is you understand that a square is needed, that you have to focus on things in your life that are important, be it's your mental health, your family. Some people want to get married. Some people want to be community pillars, someone to be financially savvy. Whatever is important in your life at this point, start to equally invest your time and energy into all those areas. Because when things get hard, and it will get hard, when life gets challenging and you don't know what you're going to do now, marriage is falling apart and your kids are acting up and your job is crazy. The only things you can depend on are things that have consistently grown with you or grew with you over the period of time. So don't get so invested in being a good student that you forget to be a good friend, that you forget to be a good community leader, that you forget to be a better version of you. Because if you get lost in this pathway and you can't get lost in it, you will find yourself in a spot where I found myself a few years ago when I was really, really good at being a doctor. I was really, really good at being a Harvard grad, but I wasn't a great husband. I wasn't a great father. I wasn't involved in my community. I wasn't close to my family. I was so focused on my career, I kind of lost out. And I think that the idea of focusing on your square and building it equally will help you prevent something that we talk about a lot in medicine that's called burnout. And what burnout essentially is, is it's not depression. It's not sadness. It's things it's you getting involved in your career, so, so involved in your career that you forget to find a joy in it. And I think the reason I was able to prevent going that pathway completely is some of the principles that I learned at Florida State and Stride about team building, about leaning on your support system. Mrs. Anderson, like I said, she's Mrs. Anderson to you all, but she's my mom. I can pick a phone up and call her anytime I want to. Um, but burnout happens when you, again, get too involved in your career that it doesn't become fulfilling anymore. And the concept came from a psychiatrist back in California, I think in the late 70s or 80s. He was taking care of a lot of patients on Skid Row, um, which is a poor area in, in California. And he was going to work and then after hours, he was going to eat and then going out to these clinics and drug rehab places. And one day he looked at a photo of himself and he was on a vacation and he still had his work clothes on. He, he was so used to dressing up in his shirt and tie on vacation, he had the same attire. So it caused him to go back and reevaluate his career and what he wanted to be and if he was making the right decisions. And one day while talking to a patient, she had a cigarette in her hand. And as she was smoking a cigarette, she lit the cigarette, she was talking to him. And the whole time she's talking to him, he's staring at her cigarette. And the ashes just kept falling off and falling off and falling off and falling off. And it, it struck him, he was like, she, she lit this cigarette and she wasn't even enjoying it. She wasn't even like smoking it. She just lit it to light it. It becomes this behavior of just doing things to do things. Or you all may use the term going through the motions. He found himself going through the motions in his career and it caused him to step back and reevaluate. So the reason why it's important to stay well balanced in this field particularly, because it will consume you. And you all may have seen that or heard about that last year with the pandemic. It consumed a lot of us, it consumed a lot of our time, our lives, our loved ones. 
And if you're not balanced, you don't have a good support system, if you don't grow those things equally, then you'll find yourself in a position where um, I found myself in a few, and you can, a few years ago, and you actually can become lost. If I could give you another piece of advice, I would say focus on opportunity costs. And what I mean by that, it's a concept of economics where the, you have to look at the value of what you're trying to acquire in life and try to accomplish in life and compare it to what you're sacrificing. If you're going into medicine for the next, if you're high school, what, you got four years undergrad, four years in medical school, you got three years of residency, three years of fellowship, if you wanna do a fellow, two years of fellowship. So you're looking at four, four, three, 12, 13 years in your life where the opportunity costs, or what you're hoping to acquire has to be what you're giving up in the process. So just think about that. In the time frame that you're trying to become a physician, you may not be going to spring break. You may not be able to hang out with your friends. You probably won't be able to go buy a home. Some of you won't be able to start families at that time. What you're sacrificing to become a doctor is big because it's a fraction of time that you'll never get back. So as you're trying to become this thing that you have no idea if you're gonna like it, if you're gonna enjoy it, if it's gonna be fulfilling, the entire time you're going and working towards that goal, you have to keep building yourself. You have to keep close ties with your friends. You have to take breaks for yourself. You have to step back and say, okay, I'm working on being a doctor, I'm doing good in school, but am I a good sister? Have I been there for my parents? You know, I had the unfortunate experience of losing my mother and grandmother while I was in training. And I felt a lot of guilt because I was like, man, did I spend more Mother's Days with them? Was school that important? Because I took some more time off when they was ill. Because now they're not here anymore to see all this great success, all this time and energy they invested in me. And I, was, I wasn't able to get that back. So the opportunity cost of becoming a physician, I lost a lot of relationships. I lost a lot of friends. And so make sure as you're transitioning, as you are studying and, and working towards this wonderful field, it's a lot of positives to it as well that you're building yourself, that you're growing your square, that you're making sure you are investing in things that are important to you because those things will be with you for the rest of your life. Another piece of advice I think if I would give a younger, I would give a younger version of me is um, maintain something that's interesting in you outside of medicine. Um, the, this field is, for all its brilliance, it's very um, uniform. You know, once you get into a particular field, I'm in critical care. That consumes a lot of my time and energy in life. I work a lot. I spend a lot of time dealing with sick people, dealing with death. But I find time to make sure that I'm investing in other things. My kids, I like to research, I play sports. Uh, I'm into economics a lot, like reading about economics, things that have nothing to do with medicine. Because the field won't teach you how to become better people. It's just gonna teach you how to become good physicians. You have to build your character. You have to build your patience. I'm not talking about clientele, your inner patients. You have to build your, your, your ability to, to, to break things down critically outside of just what the labs say. You have to be able to look your patients in the eyes and tell them unfortunate results. There are numerous times at night because of my field, I have to call people two or three o'clock in the morning and have the conversation about a loved one dying. How do you tell a, I'm 40, how you tell a 45 year old male that his 23-year-old daughter died in a motor vehicle accident. How do you tell a 55-year-old mother that her husband or her wife that her husband died at two o'clock in the morning? They don't teach you that in medicine. Life teaches you that. Life teaches you that skill. I learned that skill by listening to my friends, by reconnecting with people, by listening with my eyes and not just my ears. And so when I tell you these things about building your character, building your square, building who you are, maintaining outside interests, you learn so many things about yourself in the process that you can then apply to your life, apply to your career. I think that's what the term of the art of medicine comes into play because the art of medicine is being able to practice it with a sense of civility, a sense of humbleness, um, a sense of, uh, of purpose, where when your patients talk to you, they feel human. Disease has this unpredictable way of changing people, right? We, we, we learn the nuances of how life works. Right? We learn the nuances of how medicines work. You can name any medicine to me right now, I can tell you 
probably its chemical structure. I can break down receptors. I can break down the limitations and side effects. I know how to treat medicines that treat medicines. I know all these, all this stuff, but that doesn't help me when I have to explain to a family member that I gotta put another family member on a ventilator. That conversation is not in the textbook. It's not in chapter 28. It's not any book I read and I read a lot of books. But I've been with my loved ones when they were suffering. I've seen disease and death in such an extreme fashion where people come in with just a cough during the COVID um, pandemic and then they're dying on ECMO. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's life support where they pull all the blood out of your body and have to oxygenate and put it back in. It's basically dialysis for the heart and lungs. So I've seen all these ugly things in medicine, these horrible things. And the only way I can find balance is maintain balance in my life. The only way I can find peace is focus on the things that are peaceful in my life, my kids, my family, my loved ones. The only way I can maintain some sense about the world is focus on my mental health. So as I grow my square, as I focus on the things that make me a better person, as I become older and I, I deal with the, the, the idea that I'm coming closer to the day that I won't be here anymore. Because every day you wake up, you're essentially signing a contract with tomorrow that might not come. So think about these things when you're young, because you want to prepare yourself to deal with them as you get older. And you have a unique opportunity that myself and other individuals that are older and you don't have, we don't have time. So continue to build, continue to, to grow, continue to ask questions, continue to expand your imagination and, and, and do these things with a good heart, do these things with a, a passion that can, sometimes can't be described in words, but do them the best way you can. Because the last point I wanna to talk to you about is as you become a physician or come and go into the medical field, you're gonna to have to find balance between medicine and life. What I mean by that is when you deal with people who are ill or have ailments, it has this unique way of causing you to go home and look in the mirror yourself. I've had friends who were doing okay and got routine lab work and found out they had leukemia. I've had loved ones that were on the phone speaking to me and then had a massive heart attack. And how I was able to balance those things out along with me dealing with death on so many levels is that I was able to sit back and come back and look at life and start to appreciate the small things. Medicine is awesome. It is brilliant. We have some of the best firefighters in the world. Um, but sometimes life is about preventing the fires. It's about recognizing when things are going left in your, in your life and how to bring them back center. One of the hardest parts, and I learned this from Dr. Jacqueline Lloyd at Florida State, one of the hardest parts in our lives as we become older is that we lose the ability to come back to a base or what you all learn in school is called homeostasis. As you get older, you transition to a homeostatic state where the ability for your heart rate to get back to a baseline or your lungs to tolerate pneumonia for you to move around quickly, those things fade and you can't get back to a core. So the only way to prevent those things that happen or stave off those things is to continue to focus on your core. My prayer to you all is that as you enter in this field that you don't enter it for money. Um, you don't enter it for pride. Don't try to become physicians for titles. None of that stuff matters. The only things that matters, the only thing that matters in your career that's gonna be lasting is your character, your core, in your purpose. Because all the awards I got on my wall and all the diplomas, I got six of them, all that stuff is cool. But dying patients don't care about that. They don't care about where you went to school. They wanna know that you care. We have a term that we used to use that people still use when people are at the end of life, they call it withdrawing care. I don't like to say that. I tell my nurses, don't ever say that. We may withdraw support from patients. We may take away devices from them but we never withdraw care. Medicine and life are, you know, inarguably intertwined because that's how we were able to live longer lives and live more fruitful lives. We got this opportunity to acquire more time. But in that, 
that tangled mess that we call disease and, and treatment and cure and all that stuff, it doesn't matter if people don't care. You will not become great doctors, great nurses if you don't care about people. I can't say the word, but people can see through your BS. They know when you call them at two o'clock in the morning if you mean it or not. Um, I, some of the best feelings are the moments when I get texts on my phone from nurses that say, hey, the patient you spent 12 hours trying to keep alive all night, like I did last night. Um, the young lady I was taking care of, she was 80, she had a heart attack, she had COVID, she had an ischemic arm from COVID, it caused a thrombosis in her hand, she was about to lose her hand, kidney shut down, a ventilator, heart and shut down, she just got a stent put in her heart, uh, was bleeding through a GI tract, so a GI bleed, just, just hemorrhaging, I gave her like six units of blood last night, 80 years old, just somebody's grandmother, someone's great grandmother, someone on the, on the cusp of death, and my job wasn't to save her because I knew I couldn't. My job was to give her a chance to stay alive so her family can say goodbye. That was my job last night. I had to push aside all the stuff they taught me and be human in that moment. I had to be a humanistic doctor. I had to utilize all of my skills and talents just to give her a few more hours. So when her daughter got there this morning, after my shift was over, while I was resting, they decided to make her comfort care. They decided to stop all the ventilators, stop all the drugs I was ordering, stop all the tests. And I read the message to you right now. It says 203, withdrew care. I like that word, withdrew support. At 1025 this morning, she passed at 1036. So I spent 12 hours of my shift trying to keep her alive and when they stopped all those things I did, she died in 11 minutes. The person who wrote the message said I had a rapport with, I can't say the name, her daughter, and immediately called her with concerns and encouraged them to come in this morning. The daughter was crying and was thankful for the wonderful care she received and saw her she was not ready last night to make the decision. So basically what she was saying was when I called her, she wasn't ready to make the decision to let her mom go. I knew she was suffering. I knew she had a lot going on, but all my diplomas wasn't helping me right then. It was helping me with the drugs, but it wasn't helping me to be patient on the phone. It wasn't helping me to, to be able to pull myself together and say, I understand. That came from the humanistic side. And it says, she specifically named you and the nurse last night, Andrew, her last night, and wanted to say thank you. So I wake up two o'clock this afternoon and this is what I see on my phone. This is why I became a doctor. The house is nice, the cause is nice, but that's not what's gonna be on my grave. He drove a Range Rover, they're not gonna talk about that. They don't care about this stuff. What's gonna be on my grave is that this person cared. He was a humanistic individual. That that day when Dr. Littles looked me in the eye in the audience, I felt like she was looking at me, it probably wasn't. When she said, this is a calling That's what's gonna be on my grave. That took my calling seriously. That every area in my life that was important, I grew that explosively. I, I don't wanna just be big, I wanna be great. And I want everything in my life to be great. I want my whole effort and my name, all that stuff to be great. Cause I'm trying to build legacy for my kids. I want my kids to say, you know, we're not homeless. We didn't go through what he went through, but the hard work, the sacrifice, the passion, the, the efforts he made to maintain balance. We benefit from those things today. And I could go on, but I guess I'll give you a chance to ask some questions, ask some questions I can try to answer them for you. Um, but that's all I really got to say. Thank you, Dr. Moss, for sharing your story and for all of that wisdom you shared with us as well. We greatly appreciate it. So we're going to open the floor for questions. If you would like to ask the question yourself, you can just send your name in the chat or say, I would like to ask the question and then you can unmute yourself or you can just send the question itself and then I can read it for you. Hey, for those who are scared to ask questions, the only dumb questions are the ones you don't ask. Um, as minorities, we don't have a lot of opportunities to um, ask people that look like us and are in the position we wanna be in questions. Any question you ask, I'm open to game. 
except how much I'm paying taxes, because the answer to that is a lot. You don't want, you don't want to know about that. <laughs> so we have our first question. It's how did you handle the transition between college and medical school? Uh, didn't handle it well. <laughs> um, there was a painting in there, maybe still in the library at Florida State, where it was a, um, um, a balding man standing next to a fire hydrant that had a, a water hose. His name was Dr. Pierre. He was with the first gross anatomy professor we had at Florida State when they when the college got accredited. And medical school was like drinking water from a fire hydrant. There was so much information. Um, in undergrad, a young lady who's in Bridge right now, we're in Bridge. In undergrad, we had uh, biochemistry. And in biochemistry, we learned about the Krebs cycle, which is basically the, how we break glucose down and make energy. And I think we spent about two weeks, two weeks in biochemistry, breaking down the Krebs cycle, breaking it all down, learning the nuances of acetylcholine and pyruvate and all that stuff. And in med school, it was one PowerPoint slide. And they expect you to know it. It's like, yeah, this is a Krebs cycle that I'll be on the test. Next slide. And it was this overwhelming feeling of of I mean, maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm a little out of my league. Maybe I just signed up for something I wasn't ready for because I thought I thought I bit off too much. I mean, Sam's like, you're gonna do fine. I was like, I'm not doing so fine. This is not working out for me. I think the first gross, gross anatomy test I got an 89 on, and you all know how it is. You take a test, and what you do is you you um you just see how the first test is. Like I'm gonna see how the first test is. Then I'll start studying because then I know what they ask and everything. So I studied a little bit. And I got an 89. I was like, that's not bad. So I had the first week meeting. Thank you. Hey, this is Amy, everybody. You gonna say hi? No, she doesn't say um, I had an 89 on the test. And I thought I was doing okay. And I met with the dean. The dean was like, hey, how's everything going? I said, hey, everything's going great. Studying hard, working my behind off, lying the whole time. I wasn't studying. I was going to the mall. And he's like, okay, we're just checking in because you got the lowest grade in the class. I was like, the lowest grade in the class? He's like, yeah, the class average is 97. So you got 89, so we just make sure it's not too much for you. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm messing up the curve. Okay, cool. Because um, what I quickly learned was that there are no more dumb people. Everybody's smart now. Everybody wants to be the best. Everybody wants to become physician. That's what they work hard for. So you're no longer in those classes where people sit in the back and not paying attention. You're in class with everybody who was sitting in the front of the class and the people that were not in your class because they were smarter than you. Um, so that was, a, that was a, um, a, a rude awakening for me. But if you all play sports, I don't know if you play sports, but when I played basketball, whenever I first started playing from JV to varsity or started playing with the older guys, it was, a, it was hard at first, but it made you better. You know, it, it made you better. It's no different than when some of the football players in the NFL say, they practice hard through the week, so the game on a Sunday is easy. So the good thing about medical school is that everybody's on point, everybody's smart, and it kind of encourages you to put your best foot forward as well. So it was a tough transition. It was a high and steep learning curve to go from just doing a couple pages here and there to studying for 10 and 14 hours at a time. Um, one thing you're gonna have to learn to have is what they call um, your academic stamina. You have to learn how to sit in front of a book or a computer for hours on end, because I kid you not, 10 to 14 hours a day, I study. Uh, you, you, it's just so much information. And one of the individuals that was on stride, I don't know if you remember him, his name was um, Elijah Bell. Remember Elijah? Uh, brilliant, brilliant. When he was, I was his mentor, but he's probably one of the smartest people I ever met in my life. Super smart kid. Y'all MCAT scores are on a different range now, but back then it was on a 45 point scale. I scored real long mine. I got in med school. He was like high number one percent in the country. He went to Harvard for medical school. I went there for fellowship. He went for medical school. And I asked him, I said, Elijah, how do you um how do you how do you do it? And he said, what he found was he found out that he learned in certain intervals and he timed his study around intervals. So I'm saying all that stuff to figure out how you study and become really, really good at that. Figure out how to focus on things over a long period of time. My time is 45 minutes. I can read something for 45 minutes, but after that, my brain start going off. I start rapping, you know, <laughs> texting on Facebook and all that stuff. So after 45 minutes, I stop, no matter what I'm doing, even to the day, I stop, give myself a break, check my IG account, play with my kid, watch some TV, get some snacks, get back on it. 
So figure out now, use these school, these skills now, because basically you, you're training for a marathon. Medical school is just the beginning. That's the part. The only thing that's cool about it is that you're learning something that you're interested in. So it was a tough transition, but being around other smart people, um, pushing myself, having a competitive spirit. I'm a very competitive person. You know, it helped me do well. Like I said, I was able to graduate with honors. I went from having the lowest test in the class to graduating the top 10%. So it was tough, but it was doable. Thank you. So another question is, would you say that taking care of your mental health in school would take some time to learn how to handle? How to handle like my own? Yes. Taking, like making sure your mental health is good while in school, making sure you're doing well in school. Yeah, very much so. And it's easy to forget that because you feel guilty for taking time out for yourself. Um, I, there were moments where not so much in medical school, but in residency, residency was pretty tough because it's so time consuming and it's you actually applying all the stuff you should have learned. Um, that was tough because it came off as when you said, I need a moment, you know, as if you were being weak and they're trying to change a lot of that culture now. I know as a minority, it was very hard to focus on mental health because if you all own up, there's any non-minorities in here, but for the minority students, a lot of times as you move up the ladder, you see less and less of people like you. And it's hard to raise your hand and say, I'm tired, when there's no one that can say, I identify with why you're tired. The mental health aspect becomes bigger than just depression. One thing I learned that was a, that blew my mind was the isolation. It, it, I can't explain, I can't stress to you all enough, the, the, especially young ladies who are in bridge, build those bonds and keep those relationships and friendships over time, make time. I don't care if you have to say, one every other year we're going to get together and go have dinner or something because as you get further and further away from those people that saw you at the beginning the people around you are just so different sometimes and like the, for example i joke about taxes but i don't know any black accountants like i don't know any of my, i didn't keep track of my friends that were accountants i didn't keep track of my friends that were doing these other things in real estate and so i got to the top and i had all this money and all this time and i was like okay what am i supposed to do now oh i don't play golf <laughs> oh, um, oh! I don't. I haven't played basketball in forever, and I can't because my back hurt. And so the mental health aspect it just changes. It's not the the same type of problems you have now. So I think as you learn early to cope with those problems now, you use those same skills to apply them when things get harder and more complicated. There's a whole rap song by Puff Daddy and Biggie says, "More money, more problems." He ain't lying. The problems just change. It, they become different. Now my problems are trying to get my six-year-old to read. You know, it's like those things you take with you to work and those are still mental health problems. How to discipline your kids. And, you know, my 17 year old don't speak to me sometimes. Like how to deal with that, you know, relationship issue. And you still got to walk into a place and be professional, right? You have to go into a place and act like you got it all together. Hair got to be on point. I ain't shaved today because I had a mask. Thank God for the mask. You know, you have to do all those things and be excellent all the time. And at the same time, be a pillar in the black community. At the same time, deal with all the social unrest in the community. At the same time, you know, wave at people who got Confederate flags. I mean, all these things I got to deal with as a black man in this country, those things affect my mental health. And so I'm, I'm encouraging you all to build your bonds and your support system right now, because you're going to need those in the future. Thank you, Dr. Moss. <laughs> Another student asked, do you have any specific advice for like, high school students that are interested in medicine? Um, the best advice for a high school student, since it's so far away, I know it's hard to kind of focus on something that's so far away, um, is don't go to college and major in biology. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of you all do. And when I was in Stride, I also was an undergrad Stride. Um, pre-med counselor. I was in Samson. Mom gave me a job. That was my job when I was a med student as well. And you'd be surprised when medical schools look at applicants, they don't look for degrees. They look for how well you perform in the things that you find interesting, right? If I'm a plastics engineer major and I love engineering, well, guess what I'm going to do really well in an undergrad? Engineering. And so I'd rather you be a I know medical school community would rather you be a top performing, innovative engineer student than to be a, oh, 
you got a 4.0 in biology, awesome, woo. Um, if biology is something you're interested in, I was interested in biology, um, didn't do that. But I think you should focus your undergraduate career on what you're interested in because you have two different GPAs. You'll learn this if you haven't. You have your science GPA and your core GPA. Both of those GPAs matter when you apply for medical school. For example, if I'm an English major, I only have a few opportunities to do well in those science classes because I don't have a lot of prereq uh, spots available to do those classes. So I gotta do very, really, really well in my science classes because it's the only chance I get in my prerequisites because my upper level English classes are all upper level English classes. There's nothing to do with science, but I have to do well in those. And if I'm interested in I will do well. If I'm a biology major and I really don't like science that much and I just did it because my mom told me to, well, guess what, what's gonna happen after you take those core prerequisite classes? Now you have to take upper level biology classes, evolution, ecology, plant biology. Plant biology was harder than organic chemistry to me. And so if I wasn't interested in those things, I would have not done well in those classes and I would have underperformed. So pick a career, pick a undergrad field that you really, really want to do and do that. I don't care if it's dance, do dance and then take your prerequisite courses. College want to see a more well-rounded applicant than just an applicant because you're fighting for very limited spots. This is free game. Y'all write this free game. This is, they're not going to tell you this. They're not going to tell you this. <laughs> that is excellent advice, Dr. Moss. So we have another question. What was one of the many things you had to let go to be where you are today? So I just kind of went, go circles back to that. I thought I mentioned my opportunity cost about what you had to sacrifice. Um, time with friends. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to explain this to y'all. Like I have, I went back to Jersey a few weeks ago and I'm, I remember, so I was homeless. So when I wasn't homeless, I didn't go from homeless to the suburbs. I went from homeless to the hood. I went from homeless to section eight. So my friends were in the hood and some of them are still in the hood. So when I went to New Jersey, I had to turn my cell phone off. I was like, they see me out with these goons. I'm gonna get in trouble. They're out here smoking weed and stuff, they're all crazy. And, but when I went back and I hung with those individuals, I could be a kid again. I mean, they respected me enough not to bring the foolishness around me, but I missed those bonds. I missed reaching back. I was, and, and they mistakenly thought that, hey, like, we don't want to bother Jim, he's busy. And the whole time I'm like, man, why they ain't bother me? Like, why they not calling, checking in on me, man? But it's because I let those things fall apart. And maybe, maybe me being more involved in their lives or checking in, could have kept them out of some trouble. Maybe them knowing I still care, I don't know. But I wish I would have did a better job at taking time out to build those bonds and keep those bonds. Like spring break, I didn't have to go party. I could have went back to Jersey and hung with my friends for a little bit. I could have spent my time with my brother. He had some uh, legal issues, some legal issues he dealt with. And we've, we, we, we've since mended, mended our relationship. Um, but yeah, I wish I had more time with my friends. And don't, don't sacrifice those relationships because um, Drake, that song Drake got no new friends. Yeah, yeah, trust me. Up here, there's not a better quality of people just because they make more money. Actually, they're kind of kind of horrible. So bring the people with you, keep the bonds that, that made you who you are because those are things that are going to keep you grounded. There got some good questions, man. This is awesome. Um, another question: Why did you decide to specialize in critical care? Uh, Margaret Johnson. Margaret Johnson was an ICU doctor at Mayo Clinic. Um, I went into internal medicine. It's a primary care field, mainly because when I graduated from medical school, I really didn't know what I wanted to be. I remember medicine was very new to me. So when I graduated from medical school, I, I did internal medicine because I was like, well, if the minimum I can be is a medical general practitioner, I, I still like general internal medicine. A lot of my mentors, Dr. T T Temple Robinson, um, they were medicine doctors and stuff. So I like how they had patient continuity. I love those. Um, and Florida State did a good job with giving us a well-rounded exposure to you know, general practitioners. I think they don't get enough credit for what they do and the scope of skills they have. When I was at Thomasville, those family medicine doctors could look at just a piece of lab paper and just tell you automatically what was going on with the patient. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but I wasn't really good at clinic. I like clinic a lot. I just wasn't good at it. And not that I wasn't good at the patient part. It's just that I have a little bit of ADD adult ADD, squirrel, like my brain just be going off. And then, you know, I want to know what's happening right now. I kind of want to know what's happening right now. I want to be able to put the ultrasound probe on. I want to be able to do the echocardiogram. Give me my CT results right now. I want to fix the problem. And I found out a lot of times 
And I'll give you an example. When I was with Ms. Robinson, Dr. Robinson one time, there was a patient came in who was just complaining. Just complaining, he had nothing wrong with him. And she, we walked out of the room and she said, Jimmy, ain't nothing wrong with him, he's just crazy. And I kind of laughed, she's like, no, 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 no. But crazy people get sick, so you still gotta listen. I can tell when his schizophrenic self comes in here, it might be a urinary tract infection. So I have to pay attention, I have to listen. And, and that skill that she had, you know, I thought I had it, but I really didn't have it like I wanted, like, I, like, I, like she did. I didn't have the patience. Um, and so when I got into critical care and people were in front of me and they were sick, like you can't fake being sick. My daughter's come and said, he knee hurt. I'm like, girl, get out of here. You know, but when you're sick, you're sick. And I like taking care of sick, sick patients. I like the challenge of physiology, ventilators, dialysis machine. I put catheters in, chest tubes. I take your gunshot rules, trauma, brain surgeries, heart surgeries. I'm putting in, um, you know, lines and taking care of people with drains in their brain. Anything you can deal with, any degree of sickness, I've dealt with. And I love it. And Dr. Margaret Johnson was my mentor at Mayo. How she handled sickness and end of life issues, and how she was always cool. She never got rattled. Nothing ever stressed her out. And like when you call, we call it MJ. When you call MJ, you knew well, something was going, something good was going to come out of it. And how she dealt with people that didn't make it. She had this thing she did where, where she um, wrote letters to the families a month after the patient died. She kept all the addresses. She wrote a handwritten letter saying, I'm sorry for your loss. Hope you're doing okay. Hope the pets are doing okay. And so I had a lot of great opportunities meeting people like her, but that's kind of what led me to critical care. Love it. And it's shift work. So when I'm off, I'm off. I love that. No one can call me. What does your um, day-to-day look like as a critical care doctor? Can you walk us through it? Yeah, so I do, I'm a nocturnist, meaning I work at night. And the reason I do that is because I can spend time with my daughter and I can do stride meetings, right? If I was, if uh, I'm say 6.30 my time, I'm in the St. Louis area. So I still would be at work right now if it wasn't for, and I wouldn't be able to hang out with my kids. Um, my typical day for me comes in, I come in at either seven, five or nine, depending on what job, I work at a couple of different places. I get checked out from my partner and I do my evening rounds. And what that consists of is me walking around with a computer. I got patients on ventilators, patients on different drips to keep their blood pressure up, patients to keep their blood pressure down, people that uh, are on cardiac machines, just came out of surgery, come out of surgery. And what I do is I round around and I basically go through the last of the day, see what needs to be changed and to be adjusted. And I'm putting out fires all night because a lot of times the day team does all the plans and the night team, those plans don't work. So they got to call me. Um, I'm dealing with acute issues that comes in. So when anyone comes into the ER and they can't be managed on the hospital floor, that's when I get called. Um, a quick way to sum up my job is there's something called, I'm not going to go into all this physics with you. In physiology, it's called the oxygen delivery equation. And what that equation consists of is the cardiac output, the heart, your hemoglobin, your blood count, and your oxygen account, your percentage in your blood. Those three variables, if something goes wrong with those three variables, I get called. If your heart's not working, they call me. You're bleeding and your blood cells are not working, they call me. The oxygen level is bad as they call me. So my whole job consists of managing and manipulating those three variables to keep the human body alive because you deliver about a thousand grams of oxygen every minute and you only use about 250 um, grams of it. So about 75% of your blood after it goes through your entire body still has a lot of oxygen left in it. As you get sicker, that extraction rate goes up. That percentage of oxygen available coming back to your lungs is down or back to your heart is down. My job is to fix those situations. I love it because about 30% of the time I work and 70% of the time I'm just available. So I'm not go, 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 go. Sometimes I am. Like last night I was go, 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 go. But sometimes I just watch Netflix. The other night I watched, the other night I watched, I hope, y'all ain't gonna send this to my job, is y'all go. <laughs> last night I watched eight, eight series or something. Like I watched eight episodes of something in my, in my call room bed and played on Instagram and got paid. Um, a good amount of money. But then some nights, like last night, I didn't see my car room at all. So it was feast and famine. Sometimes it's slow night and I joke around the nurses some nights, so I get three gunshot wounds. So that fast come and go, that fits my personality. So that's why I, that's why I chose for the program. That's what my day is like. Thank Great. you. So another question we have is, if you could change anything about your profession, what would it be? What I do with the overall profession. 
your field in general? My field, um, <laughs> okay, this is gonna sound very mean. Um, and this is why you have to, and so let's go back to the first question about what you do as high school, shadow a bunch of different doctors because you don't really know what it's like until you're actually in it. Like people say, I wanna be a pediatrician. Do you want sick kids coughing on you all day or day? No, you don't want that. You wanna take care of kids with lollipops and stuff. So if you wanna do pediatrics, understand you wanna take care of sick kids, not just kids. So the one part about my job that I would change is, I don't like dealing with other doctors. I don't. Uh, when people get sick, I'm just being real. I don't, when people get sick, and not just any doctors, people get sick, no one wants to take care of a sick patient. No one. When people get sick, they walk out of the room. They, ah, I don't know what to do. And they call me. And a lot of times, they ring that little bell, I think just a little too soon sometimes. So I have the unfortunate uh, job of telling them, your patient ain't that sick. Call me later sometimes. And I, and I hate doing that, but I have to. A lot of times, people try to dump their work off on me. Because when they're sick, that's the mob, that's, um, that's not their problem anymore. And so it's hard because you don't want to waste ICU beds. You know, COVID really put a stress on us. In California, they ran out of beds. They were putting people in, in um, the guest shops, the gift shops in cafeterias. They ran out of beds. So it's a very, very limited resource field. So you're very careful about who you allow. I think I'm too dark for this room. I'm light, so I'm gonna be, be very careful who I allow into the ICU. And so sometimes people want to just dump their patients because they don't feel like dealing with it, and I hate that. Um, but I was told by one of my attendings, uh, one of my attendings when I was in internal medicine, always be a good doctor. If someone doesn't want to take care of a sick patient, take care of them because they won't do a good job and people are going to die. So I don't like working with some doctors because some doctors are lazy. I'm just being honest with you. They don't, they don't like to work. They, it's easy to call me and dump it off on me. The problem is I'm a little too smart for them to dump off on me without them having a real good story. So I got to do a lot of attitudes, a lot. A lot of funny stares when I walk in the ER. They don't like me down there at all. <laughs> so another question we have is, did you always want to work in the hospital or did you ever want to open your own private practice in internal medicine? Yeah, I wanted to do internal medicine. Like I said, I wanted to do um, clinic because I had a lot of mentors, um, Dr. Lloyd, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Bromo Smith. I don't know if they're still there or not. Um, by the Temple Robinson I told you about. Um, just so many people I saw that were pillars in their community. Um, but what I learned very quickly was how you help people is varied, right? You can say, I wanna help people. And sometimes helping people is just having them come in your clinic and you take good care of them. Um, sometimes it's donate money to a community center. Sometimes it's doing Zoom meetings with trial students. Um, so one time I wanted to work in the um, outpatient setting, but I like the fast paced, intense, I like hospital settings. I like the, when I walk into the ICU, it's my ICU. That's my, that, that's my clinic. That is my clinic. Like everybody there is waiting for me to get my orders and wait for me to make my decisions. And that's my domain. And so it's not the same in regards to continuity of care, but you know, I still give the same care, I think, as someone who, um, you know, take care of someone comes in with their blood pressure. I'm dealing with just blood pressure on another extreme level. Um, I enjoy hospital settings. I, I, I understand the hospital nuances a little bit better than I understand outpatient um, things. I know some of my friends who have clinics, they have a lot of challenges now with hospital absorbing a lot of clinics. Um, so a lot of independent practices. I'm not sure, maybe in some small areas, small rural areas, but in the cities, the hospitals are buying up all the, the clinics now. So you're working under the umbrella of a hospital. And I don't know how, what, how, that's, how that's gonna move in the next 10, 20 years, I'm not sure. Um, but whatever you do, whatever field you go in, whether it be pediatrics or pediatric neurosurgery, just be really smart. Just, just know your stuff. No matter what you do, know your stuff. Because if you know your stuff, then they, they, they can't bother you. But I love, I love hospitals and I love the challenges with it. I love working with ICU nurses. Um, I like toys, I got a lot of toys to play with. I got a $2,000 portable ultrasound in my bag right now that I use all the time. So I like that stuff. I like gadgets and gadgets and all that stuff. Thank you. That looks like all the questions. All the questions. Do we have any other questions from anyone? Any final questions?
thank you again, Dr. Moss, for coming to speak oh, with us. Oh, I wish you all the best. I'm glad you invited me out. Like I said, Ms. Anderson, got my y'all got my email address. If you got any questions, let me know. If anybody interested in different fields, particularly fields I'm in, internal medicine, anesthesia, and critical care, just let me know. I'm more than happy to help out. Thanks so much, son. It was great. I, I gotta get down there to see you. I gotta get down there soon again somehow. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our our students. No, thank you, sir. I really appreciate you, Doc. <laughs> And thanks for what you're doing for COVID and for the patients that you've seen. I, I'm sure it's it, been difficult. It's been tough. It's been, um, I lost my father-in-law to COVID um, and my brother was in the hospital with it. And so, you know, I've seen so many, and it's hard for me, I actually got, I was on Facebook. I actually had to get off Facebook because, you know, you hear people talk about how it's not real and you're dealing with death every single day. I'm like, you have no idea and how bad it is. Y'all have no idea because you're all, you, you, you are out in the world. You don't see the sick, sick people. These people come in and to be as well-trained as I feel I am, to, to lean on people that I know that are smart than me and say, hey, what, what, what are you doing? And they're looking at me like, I don't know, man. To, to see this disease outsmart the smartest people I know is, is it's impressive. It's scarily impressive and it's sad at the same time. It showed us how underprepared we were for it. You know, hospitals run on thin margins. They're not these big old money-making machines y'all think it is. They, a lot of them are just not getting by. And they had to stress your nurses out and your, and your PPE and your doctors out. You know, family members, people on ventilators for 20 days, 30 days. Like, um, it's just complication. We're still learning out. We're still learning. So it's been tough. It's been really tough. Um, Because you get into it to make people better. I didn't get into it for people to die. And so at one point, I think at one point, every patient we had on the ventilator for like a three month period died, like every patient. And so it was like, geez, man, what am I doing? Like, 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 it made you feel like all that training was pointless. Like this one little virus came and just shut everything down. But it, but it helped me appreciate life a little bit more. Uh, it helped me to take things like this Zoom meeting seriously because you all are next generation of doctors. And if I don't take it enough time out of my busy schedule to come talk to you all, how are you gonna do this for someone else? So, Nah, it's been really tough, Doc, but but we're finally getting over the curve. I hope you know, keep taking y'all vaccines. I got my right, I got my that's great. And if any more students have questions, you can either later on you can either email them to me, Amanda, Tamara, or Mrs. Truel, and then we'll get them to Dr. Moss. Yeah, I, I, I promise you, I'll answer. I promise you. I will. And, and Dr. Dr. Benzi, I just want to personally introduce you. Dr. Benzi is our Sarasota campus regional dean. Hey, Doc. Hi, thank you so much. So inspirational. And um, I really love how you can share your message and also give very real advice that I think everybody appreciates. You know, I was chuckling the whole time because I can, I, I hear your message and I so agree with it. And I love that um, you can, that you shared that with everyone. I, I really appreciate you uh, doing this tonight. So thank you. I think no, thank you all. I didn't I didn't write anything down. This is all from the heart. I don't write stuff down. Let me just be real with y'all. So and you that's know, what we, that's what we appreciate. You mentioned New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. Where were you? Uh, so did I. <laughs> I grew up in the two parts. I was in South Jersey. So am I. <laughs> I grew up I grew up in Camden. Oh, Cumberland County, right under you. Gotcha. I'm with yeah. I'm with the farms at way, way down. Like by Delaware. Like, it was like where they put the trash at when they dropped the trash off back in the day. Yeah. I'm where they called the Garden State. That's why they called the Garden yeah. State. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was there. I, I, don't, I don't know why I claimed I was there for eight years of my life from 12 to 20, but I'm a Floridian. I was in Florida for 20 years of my life, but I claimed Jersey because that's where I went to high school at. So I'm probably I'm really a Floridian. I live in Fort Lauderdale long I live in Jersey. So. Well, that's a coincidence <laughs> that all the doctors are from Jersey. Yeah. yeah. We got something good coming out of Jersey. We are. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. But Doc, if you ever need me to come down and talk to the kids in person and the students, I'd be happy to. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that Thank offer. You. Thank you. Amy's looking for every chance she get to go to Jersey, Florida, so she's happy to come down there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm about to go. Y'all be safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.